Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me this morning. My, uh, again, a couple of things in the comments. Uh, can't hear. I hope you can now. My name is Ronnie Nolan. I am director of the Kentucky Educational Collaborative for State Agency Children. Uh, it is our uh, pleasure to welcome you this morning to our 20th annual Kentucky Alternative Education Summit. Uh, this is our uh, 20th year of putting on this event, our second year of providing this professional development virtually for you. Um, hopefully, we are excited and anticipating that next year we will be able to go back uh, to in-person professional development. We'll be starting um, our, our in-person professional development in August with our new educators training uh, coming up for new folks who are joining our KEXAC team. And so we're really excited about that, but we are hopeful that as we move forward that um, if all of us are taking care of ourselves and each other, that we'll be in good shape moving forward into the next year to resume uh, our professional development series in person. And so we're really looking forward to that. But before we even get to, to that for next year, we have an amazing agenda planned for you today and tomorrow that, that we know that you're going to get a lot out of, and we certainly hope that you will. One of the things I think that sets this PD apart from a lot of others is that we are not uh, a pedagogical kind of uh, uh, training for you. We're not going to talk about uh, a whole lot about big picture issues. We're going to talk about strategies. We're going to talk about uh, things that you can learn in your classroom, uh, learn today and take back to your classroom tomorrow, which I think is one of the things that really sets us apart uh, from a lot of the other professional development that is taking place, uh, particularly our PD focuses on alternative education settings and on what we can do in alternative schools across Kentucky uh, and across the nation to uh, help our students be successful uh, and to have lives of purpose and promise who are going to do great things. And so we're excited that you're partnering with us uh, in providing and, and, and participating in this, uh, in this great event. So thank you all for being here this morning. Before we get too far, um, I will say uh, that I want to give a special thank you to Katie Helton in our office. Uh, Katie is our uh, assistant director for uh, professional development. That's not the official title, but that's probably what you guys uh, mostly know her for. She's done a fantastic job of pulling folks together and organizing this event. So I want to make sure that we uh, say thank you to Katie for all of her hard work that makes the rest of us get to just hang back and and look good uh, while she really does kind of more of the grunt stuff. So thank you, Katie, for everything that you've done. And then also our presenters. Uh, we have a lot of great presenters today and tomorrow, uh, a lot of great partners across Kentucky who are working with us. And so we want to make sure that they know we appreciate them as well. And If you're on this uh, big session so far and you're one of our presenters coming up, uh, we just want to say thank you for partnering and for providing such great opportunities for uh, our teachers and educators who are working in alternative education settings across Kentucky. So thank you all as well. Um, as I said, this is our 20th year. We really started uh, this KEXAC conference way back in 2001. And at that point, it was uh, really focused in on KEXAC programs on working with state agency children. And over the years, it has really evolved into something that is much larger. And now we have uh, lots of folks from across the Commonwealth who are joining us who work in what we call traditional alternative education programs. And we even have folks who are in uh, more traditional schools across Kentucky as well. We think the things, the strategies that we're learning here that we talk about uh, have applicability to not only traditional alternative schools, but all schools across Kentucky because great strategies that are effective work everywhere. Uh, and so we're really excited to have those folks joining us as well. And so as I said, this is our 20th year. We've now emerged into a Kentucky Alternative Education Summit, which has a much larger umbrella. Uh, and we're really excited about the opportunity to provide professional development training, uh, not just to our folks, but other folks across Kentucky who are partnering with us. So thank all of you for being here. We're really excited uh, to get this started this morning. There's a couple of things I want to uh, just share with you. Um, as we get going or a couple of housekeeping things before we get into our program. Uh, the first one is that just a reminder that all of our meeting times today are in Eastern time. So we want to make sure that we have folks all across Kentucky 
uh, many of you are in your central time zone and and uh, all of the printed times in our programs are Eastern. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at the agenda today and as you're going through uh, talking about what we're going to do. So we don't want you to miss anything and we certainly want you to be uh, to be part of us. So thank you guys uh, for doing that. Also, there may come a time uh, when you might have some trouble getting into a session or maybe uh, something else is happening and, and maybe it's an issue on our end. Uh, if that's the case, we want to give you a contact number uh, this morning, and that is for Sherry Kluski. Sherry Kluski is our associate director here in the office, and she is on standby to assist anybody who might need her. Uh, obviously, you have her email. Uh, her email is sherry.kluski at eku.edu, and her phone number, which is a direct line for her cell, is 859-576-0844. Four, three. And I'm going to ask uh, Katie or Cindy in our office there to if you guys or Sherry who's on here as well, if you will add that into the chat section to make sure that folks have contact information for you as well. So we'll put that in the chat. If you have any troubles throughout the day today or tomorrow, uh, you'll have her direct contact information and she'll be able to help you. So we hope that doesn't happen, but if it does, uh, it's good that we have folks here who can assist us. So thank you, Sherry, for being on standby and uh, our troubleshooter today in case uh, anything goes wrong. So she just put her phone number in the chats and she's going to add her email in there as well. So just keep those handy. And if you have anything, again, please feel free to contact her. A couple of things on our agenda today. I just want to draw your attention to uh, you see that we sent out everybody an agenda early. It looks like this. Um, it has information in it. Uh, Katie also just put a link to all of that and uh, to our Google Drive in the chat. So if you didn't get that, you can go in there. All of the handouts, uh, this agenda, all of the descriptions uh, are available in there as well. So you can look at all of those and uh, and you'll be able to find basically just about any information you might need. So uh, we hope that you'll do that. But throughout the agenda, we want to just make sure to draw your attention to a couple of things that are going on here. We're starting obviously with our opening session this morning with John O'Connor, who we'll be introducing in just a few minutes. Uh, we had the pleasure of hearing him speak recently, and I think you guys will be very impressed with what he has uh, to share with you today. So we're really excited about that. And then after that opening session, we'll have a short break, uh, and then we'll come back together uh, for some breakout sessions from 1045 to 1145. In the handouts that you have, you have a description of each one of those. Uh, and on that description, it has a link uh, for joining that session. So uh, we just want to make sure that you all, we've been doing these uh, Teams meetings, Zoom meetings for over a year now, almost a year and a half, it feels like. Uh, so I'm guessing most of you know how to do this, but if you don't, uh, it's very simple. In the description, it has join here that is highlighted. You simply click on that link and it'll take you to that session. Uh, again, if you have any problems doing that, uh, Sherry and Cindy Held in our office are both on standby and be able to help you. So feel free to give them a call or an email if something is going on and you can't get in. But uh, it's pretty simple uh, kind of layout to our program so you'll be able to join. We have three different breakouts during each of our breakout times, so you'll be able to select which ones of those you'd like to go into. Uh, we would advise you to look ahead because some of those are repeat offerings. And so you want to make sure that uh, if that you schedule your day accordingly so that you get all of the sessions in uh, that you really need and would like to attend. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, one other thing this afternoon after our opening, we do have a featured session that is going to close out our day today, and that is uh, Pockets Change. Uh, it is a financial literacy uh, course. And this is the first in uh, a three part series. So we want to draw your attention to that as well. So uh, today we'll be having the first hour of our presentation on pockets change, uh, which is a uh, combination of hip hop and financial literacy that really talks about uh, social justice from a financial literacy standpoint, where it says that when you are in charge of your finances, then you can make real social change. And it's about teaching our kids how to change their lives through money management and through uh, an understanding and appreciation of their relationship uh, with money and what that looks like. Uh, something that is also a part of the Kentucky academic standards and part of the requirements for graduation. So we want to make sure that we're providing 
opportunities for you to learn how to meet that requirement of financial literacy, which was just added in to our graduation requirements. So uh, we're really excited about that. Again, this is the first in a three part series. The next two series will be held on August 25th and September 22nd. And you'll be getting information about that as well from Katie Helton in our office to register for those. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. It's a, it's a fantastic high energy uh, event that's gonna happen this afternoon as our first part. And we know that you'll want to come back for those second and third parts of the series later in this semester. We also tried to schedule those pretty early in the semester so that you can get the skills and the resources you need uh, early on to be able to integrate this into your classrooms and into your curriculum. So we're really excited about that uh, and look forward to that session this afternoon. Um, we also, I think that is uh, just about all of the housekeeping information we have. Again, we've been doing Zoom and um, Teams meetings for a while now, so we know that if you need to if you need to stretch, stretch. If you need to take a bathroom break, take a bathroom break. If you need other things, you know, we encourage you to do that. That's the beauty uh, of these kinds of events uh, and something that we've really, I think, grown accustomed to over the over the last year. So, uh, again. Uh, Self-care is important, so take care of yourself so you can take care of others, and, uh, and that's what we're going to focus on over the next two days. So again, we're really excited that you are here and look forward to um, all of the things that are happening in the next two days with us. We still have uh, folks who are joining us as we go along, uh, and we will have others uh, joining uh, as well. I think uh, we had about 350 folks who registered, just shy of 350 folks who registered for this event this year. Uh, which is a really great uh, turnout for us. And we will continue to add folks in to this session and others uh, as we go throughout the day today and tomorrow. So uh, very excited about that. So the chat is enabled. Uh, you'll probably notice that you don't have cameras on and you've been uh, muted. Uh, the team system has automatically done that. Um, we can change that if speakers throughout. So we will have facilitators in each of your groups uh, and if there is need for that, uh, we certainly can do that to, to be able to allow those kind of things to happen. But uh, for our bandwidth purposes and others, uh, we have an automatic setting just on the upfront for that. So you may be seeing that you tried to unmute or you tried to um, turn your camera on. And we just want you to know there's a there's a method to the madness in that about uh, trying to make sure that everything flows as smoothly as possible uh, throughout this event. We have a lot of folks on here and uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose connection or connectivity uh, and all of those kinds of things. So uh, if we need it, we can do it, but just be aware that it's not you on your end, it is us on our end, and uh, we will work with our presenters obviously to do uh, whatever needs to be done with that. But uh, again, appreciate you guys being here. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started this morning. We are uh, very excited to welcome our first speaker, we have uh, John O'Connor, who is going to join us and provide us with a great session this morning. Um, and we're we're very excited about his session. We, again, I told you we saw him recently, uh, did a fantastic job uh, with all of our programs and talking about uh, things and strategies that that we really thought were valuable and that we needed to see within our uh, programs as well. So very excited about that. John O'Connor uh, has led school improvement initiatives at state and local level during his 30 years in public education. Uh, 30 years, obviously, you know, he has a very long tenure working in education, and so we're excited to bring all of those years of experience to us today. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciated about his presentation that we saw uh, is that he modeled uh, the strategies that he was talking about, uh, that he said um, to our folks, we want to make sure that that um, when we say we want to do these kinds of things in our classroom, that we also model that behavior. And so the, we witnessed that firsthand, and I, I think you'll see that again today as well. John started his career as a special education teacher serving students with orthop orthopedic impairments in elementary and middle schools. Um, special education, obviously, is something that's very uh, critically important within our programs. We know that um, we have a largely disproportionate number of our students who have an identified special education need. Uh, and so we know that it's critical that we have folks who have this experience and who understand uh, the needs of our students to share information with us. And so we're really excited uh, also about the background that 
that John is bringing to the table today uh, and his depth of experience that is directly relatable to what it is that we're doing. But since he transitioned out of that time, he's held a variety of administrative positions as well. Uh, for nine years, he worked at the Georgia Department of Education. He led, sta he led statewide initiatives uh, to improve achievement and learning of students with disabilities. Uh, he also served in local school districts as an assistant director for special education, the executive director for special services. He was an assistant superintendent for student services and director of interventions. Um, a lot of those titles you have familiarity with. We have a lot of uh, curriculum coaches, intervention specialists, principals, uh, su superintendents, assistant superintendents, special education teachers, uh, general education teachers, and others who are with us today. So I know that you'll be able to relate your experience uh, to that of John as well. He has also written five books, his most recent being the second edition of Great Instruction a great achievement for students with disabilities, a roadmap for special education administrators. He also co-wrote a textbook chapter, a desk guide, and numerous other articles. Uh, and since his retirement from the school system, he has also been providing training, school visits, and coaching to hundreds of groups, not only in his home state of Georgia, but also across the country. And so we are very excited to welcome this morning uh, our opening keynote speaker, John O'Connor. So John, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. And we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us this morning. Welcome. Good morning. <clears throat> um, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. What a nice introduction. And I'm so happy to be here. Um, I know I've had a chance to meet with both Ronnie and Katie. And let me tell you, you guys are in good hands. Um, what a, uh, I've learned about the state programs. And so I'm just so thrilled to be here. Now, I know what you're thinking right this second. Um, since I had 30 years in education, I know you're thinking, how can a man who clearly is only 25 years old, how in the world could he have had 30 years? Of course, I'm joking. Um, I wear all those years with pride. Um, so I'm so happy to have you. Now, let me do my trick and share my screen um, with you. I'm a little more of a Zooms guy. Um, Give me one second, still trying to figure this out. Hey, Katie, John, help me. Yes. I was gonna say, John, while you're, while you're doing that, I'll just share with the group uh, an additional issue. We are all more Zoom people. So uh, this is our first statewide professional development that we're offering on the team's platform um, and so we're all learning this so i would just ask that all of us here be a little bit patient uh, we're all trying to figure all of this out together and so uh, we'll do that and it might be a little bit rough getting going but we're going to get there and just hold in tight with us we appreciate your patience and, and being with us this morning thank you and john it looks like you're sharing so thank you very much awesome um Thank you guys for your patience. Um, let me tell you, that's something we've all learned is um, patience. So here's my contact information. Again, it's John O'Connor. There's my email address. I'm going to hold on to that old Bell South address as much as I can. It's an oldie. Um, but there's my cell phone number. I want you guys to feel absolutely comfortable contacting me anytime. I love to brainstorm with educators. I certainly don't think that I have all the um, silver bullets, but um, together maybe we can brainstorm or you can call me to expand my thinking. I love that. Um, but let me jump on again. I was, um, I will uh, go a little bit prior to my um, time in education. So I've been around disability my entire life. 
Uh, my mother had a very, very significant disability. And, and I'm going to talk about her in just a little bit. Uh, my ex-wife and I have two kids. Um, both of our sons have uh, participated in special education services. Um, and then to hear all the jobs that I've done. I um, mean, the best bullet on this page is the last bullet. I am retired. I retired a few years ago, so I get to do this full time. I promise when you get there, you'll really enjoy it. So if you would, um, go in the chat. I want to know what your role is. Um, very quickly, and they'll run by super fast. Um, if you don't mind, go in the chat um, and tell me. Um, I see some folks are having trouble, but if you would go in the chat, tell me your role. Are you a teacher? Are you a, I heard something about uh, curriculum coaches or um, special ed teacher? Oh, such good folks. Instructional coaches. I see a principal coordinators, teachers, counselors. Awesome. Alternative school teacher, hospital teacher. Wonderful. What a great group we have. Um, lots of teachers. Oh, my favorite kind of people. Social workers. Awesome. Special ed teacher. I send general ed, to regular and special ed. Awesome. What a fantastic group. So thank you for letting me be here and thank you for sharing that. Let me go back and share my screen a little bit. Oops, I'm gonna get better by this by the end. I promise I'm gonna get better at this by the end of this. Oh, I can't find my PowerPoint. I am so sorry for this, but thank you for your patience. That's one thing we've learned is. Hmm. Well, I will get that to work in a, in a second, I promise. Um, so, but let me uh, dig a little bit um, more into my background. Um, usually I share a little bit about this, um, but I don't share, um, I don't share it as deeply as I'm going to share with you guys because um, I think it's relevant here. I mentioned my mother had a very significant disability. Um, she had schizophrenia. Um, and many people think um, that that is multiple personality disorder, and that is not what that is. That's an old wives' tale. But schizophrenia is a brain disorder that, and I'm, I'm sure many, many of you are familiar with it, and I imagine lots of you have served youngsters who have schizophrenia. It's a brain disorder that really turns into a mental illness. Um, and so it usually presents itself in young adulthood, um, and so she had schizophrenia as long as I can remember. I have four siblings, so there are five of us. Um, and so it's, and that results in the way the brain works. So people with schizophrenia very often have delusions. So they believe, truly, deeply believe things that aren't true. Very often it's paranoid that people are trying to get them in some way. Um, it's a lot of conspiracy thinking, um, and it's a true belief system. And it shifts and, and things like that. So I guess I come to this presentation not only as an educator, uh, but also as someone who has experienced um, I mean, uh, disability my entire life. As long as I can remember, she was in and out of hospitals. Um, she's passed away. She passed away about 20 years ago. Um, but she was so impacted that she spent the last 12 or 13 years of her life in institutional care. I wish I could tell you it was hospital care, um, but when you get to that point and have, um, there really aren't those types of long-term placements. Um, so it was really institutional care. There was some therapeutics going on. So I guess I come to this um, from a real, I think, deep perspective. Um, 
And so hopefully I can combine those things. But what I want to do is today I want to talk about six big ideas. Three of the ideas are meant to kind of help us know our students a little bit more. Um, and I, I bet what I'll say there is you guys are very familiar with these ideas, but hopefully if we take a little time together, maybe I can help you think of them in a different way. And then I'm going to talk about three ideas that we can do to really um, have a huge impact on our students. Of course, I'm an educator, so I'm coming from that perspective. Um, but let me now, I'm going to try again with my screen. Um, can you guys see that, I hope? Katie, can you see that? Yes, sir. A little about you. Awesome. So I learned a little about you. Let me also start by saying thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. Um, let me tell you, educators, you as an educator or whatever role you're in, you drastically change the lives of your kids. And that means you change the lives of their families and you change the lives of the community, right? Um, it's very hard to see sometimes, just like it's hard to see your own personal children um, grow. It's hard to see kids that we work with grow because it happens um, in tiny bits. And you guys do that every year. And let me tell you, last year was not like every year. Holy crack moly! who would have ever thought that something that a pandemic would happen. So I just want to make sure you hear. Thank you for what you did. Now you you were given scratch paper, so hopefully you have the handouts for this month. They're just a couple of pages, but if you if you um, don't, it's okay. You can just use a blank sheet of paper because I can walk you through it. Um, let's pretend this. <clears throat> Let's pretend you have a new colleague who has started to work at your program. And your principal, if that's the name of your supervisor or whatever the title of your supervisor is, says, hey, you're such a great educator. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to our new colleague, our new teacher here, and I want you to tell him or her three things that will be very, very helpful for them. It may be things that help them understand the students better, your students, or it can be actions that can, he can do to make his students be more successful. It can be emotional. It can be um, social emotional. It can be academic. So on your paper, in your handouts, you have this spot. But if you don't have it, it's okay. You can just use a blank sheet of paper. But let me give you a couple of minutes to write what three things would you share with your new teacher colleague? Go ahead and write that down. When you're ready, if you would, go in the chat and write one of those things. You may have to shorten it to make it a phrase, but what are the big powerful things that you would share with your colleague to help them be successful with his or her students? Go in the chat and write one of the things you wrote on your piece of paper. So if you would go in the chat and write one is what is one of the recommendations you'd make to your colleague to help them be successful? You've been asked by your principal to be a good mentor. What would you write? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Somebody be brave and go ahead and start that for us.
Come on now, I can have somebody put that in. One recommendation. I'm seeing lots of chats. Are you seeing them? I'm not. I'm seeing mine are frozen, but let me X okay. mine out. Let okay. me X mine out and open mine back. Oh, there they go. There's tons of them. I thought, oh my goodness, folks aren't doing it. Um, let's see. Stay positive and keep up with technology, build relationships, say one positive thing to every student every day. I love that. Don't lose your cool. Love that. Um, trust. Take each day as a new day. Kids have bad days and don't hold. Oh, such a good thing. Uh, Russell, fantastic. Uh, you may be the only positive um, thing that and they see a person or element they see today. So smile. Awesome. Build relationships with students and families. Such good stuff. Make them feel safe in your room. Boy, is that not powerful? Don't take things personally. Um, as a hospital teacher, communicate with students, homeschool counselors, like, oh, fantastic. Um, let them Know that being strong and stick to it. So what you say, know that you want from them to go over and stick to it. So kind of share expectations and have and be consistent, I think was the message. Don't sweat the small stuff. Boy, we all need that. Um, such good information. Thank you for sharing. I was, I'm sorry for that delay. So let me go back to my, my screen. Such good elements so here's my first big idea and the first, again the first three or so we can get to to um, learn our students a little better many of our students who have repeared uh, experienced trauma or chaos are often in a fight or flight mindset um, I know that many, many of your kids who are in, the, in your program have kind of a history of experiencing trauma or if not trauma, then certainly chaos. And I'm not making that, that's certainly not all of your kids, but some kids are in that place right there. And to be honest, it's been helpful for them. Uh, it's this, when I say fight or flight, it's this heightened sense of expecting something to happen um, even when things um, chaotic aren't happening. And that, that heightened sense really has an impact on the child. It's kind of like your motor running at a super high gear all the time. Again, it's been helpful for them, but it can also have an impact on how they respond behaviorally and emotionally. So sometimes you'll Certainly, you'll see children have a very um, extensive response to something that you don't necessarily think warranted that response. Well, of course, many times it's not really about what just happened, right? It's about that heightened sense that kids are in. Um, and so just be aware of that. And many, many of you are certainly on the flip side. It can also lead to some strengths. Many times kids like that, and this is, I don't have the research to support it, but this is just my experience. Many times kids like that are great in emergencies, are great once we can help them kind of modulate that and reaching out to other kids. Um, I know um, I taught kids with stud um, students with orthopedic impairments way back when, when I first started teaching. And I'd often have, um, other students, we certainly did inclusive work, and this was in the early 90s, co-teaching work way back when, but we also, I also had some periods when my kids were with me in the class, and I tried to get other kids in my class. Some of the best students with my students were those students with emotional and behavior disorders, and that's our terminology in Georgia. It was amazing to watch. You would see this kid who had kind of developed this tough exterior who was being served in this, an, a different special ed program in the school come in my school. And there was this mutual adoration. 
my kids who had orthopedic impairments looked up at them like, wow, they're like this kid. And likewise, our, our kids with emotional behavior disorders could be more vulnerable and looked at my kids with just tremendous respect. So even though the fight or flight kind of instinct or mindset can lead to some volatile reactions, it also can bring with it great strengths. So think about that for a second and go to that second spot on your handout. Does the idea that some students are in a fight or flight mentality seem true to you? Have you seen that demonstrated by some students? Very quickly, go ahead and um, write your answers there. Of course, don't name a student. But write your reactions to that, if you would, on that piece of paper or on any piece of paper. When you're ready, I want you to go in the chat. Tell me your reactions. Does this seem um, true to you? Um, people are coming, yes, many, uh, many, most. Thank you, Eric. Most of my students are like that. Thank you, Mike. Yes, I'm seeing a lot of it. typical for most of your students, yes. Um, Thank you so much. Many, many yeses. Many students, awesome, awesome. All. They tend to lash out as a form of self-defense. What a fantastic way to say that. Sometimes I'm so impressed when people say something, they use six words to say something I'm trying to say in 32. So all, thank you for that. I'm very typical. And so that can help us understand kids a little more. Um, it sounds like you've already recognized that, but just know that very often how they respond is not a reflection of what's happening at that moment. It's kind of that heightened sense. Yes, many will say and do things in front of an audience they might not say talking with them one to one. Thank you, Justin. Such good impact. Let me get my screen back up. So if you would, in your handout, I'm gonna give you a place to write the six big ideas I'm gonna share. And the first one, of course, if you don't have this handout, you can just write it on a piece of paper, is that many students who have experienced trauma or chaos are often in the fight or flight mindset. That can help us um, understand our youngsters a little bit more. Number two is acting in can be just as challenging as acting out. We know that um, teenagers, part of being a teenager is some level of acting out, right? That's just normal part of adolescence. Kids are going from completely dependent on their parents to transitioning to adulthood. And, and part of that is a little conflict with parents. And it's uh, certainly on a continuum. And so that's normal. So we all know what acting out looks like. In fact, I'm sure that many of the children in, in, in the state programs, and I'm very familiar with state programs, you see acting out. But I also want to challenge you of um, paying attention to those kids who are acting in. And that means kind of their in, internal thinking and dialogue. Sometimes you'll have kids who have experienced trauma and who have people in their families who are not well, and they internalize that as that's their fault. Or they internalize that as if I'd just done something different, things would have been different. Um, and so they may not be acting out as much as their classmate, but it still can be just as significant for that child. Um, in fact, in a lot of ways, acting out can be healthier than acting in because at least there's a release of some of those feelings. So if you would, right, acting in, number two is acting in can be just as challenging as acting out. Number three, of course, is behavior is communication. I bet you guys have heard that a ton. 
that when kids misbehave um, very often, and it's not intentional communication, right? Kids don't say, I'm going to do this because I'm trying to communicate something. It just comes out. But that insightful teacher or educator or administrator can be very good at saying what's underneath that communication. Um, and it doesn't mean that students know what they're feeling or know what they're communicating. And I'll give a personal example. Um, we'll write this real quick, behaviors communication on number three. And I'll give a personal example. Um, of course, one of the tricks, tricks, that's not the right word. One of the processes we use when kids have misbehavior is to figure out the function of the behavior. What is underneath the behavior? Why is the child doing it? Because it's serving him or her a function. And, and one reason can be pain attenuation. A child is trying to get rid of pain. We very often think of physical pain. And very often people only think of pain attenuation of children who have maybe very significant intellectual disabilities. But it can also be other children. I'll tell you about my, my kids. I got two good boys. Um, they are 19 and my oldest is turning 21 in just the, the next couple of weeks. They're both big old healthy kids, right? They think they can take their dad, but let me tell you, they can't take their dad, so. But my youngest son, uh, both of our children were brought, um, joined our family through adoption. Um, and my youngest son is from a set of islands in way out in the Pacific Ocean called the Marshall Islands. Um, if, you, if you get to Hawaii, of course, many of us have not, certainly. And if you fly six more hours towards Australia, you can land in the Marshall Islands. Well, when he was a very little baby, he had a number of health things. Um, he was allergic to tons of stuff. He had tons of reflux. He just had lots and lots of little things, nothing in and of themselves huge, but the combination um, really had an impact on him. Now he's big old healthy and fine. But when he was about two, um, as many of you know, little kids have board books. We had board books. So they're, they're little books for little kids, but the pages are cardboard. So they're easy to handle for um, little fingers. And our youngest child started chewing on the edges of the books. And it looked like a rat had been in our home. We'd pick up a board book and it would have um, chewed edges on the corners. And um, when people eat non-edible things, the term is pica. Um, very, we see it very often in kids with very significant intellectual disabilities. But my son, um, even though he was having challenges, did not have significant intellectual disability. And we couldn't figure this out. Like, what had we done wrong as parents so that he was eating non-edible things? And one day I'm driving down the road um, and I have this. Um, I, I kind of have some reflux or some, um, there's another word for indigestion. And I thought to myself, boy, if I just had a rich cracker, that would just, and I went, dang. That's it. He is eating cardboard because it settles his stomach. There's a purpose to this. And shortly after that, we thought he had reflux. Um, my wife was fantastic at working this, but he had a, one of those tests where you put tubes down the nose and it, they tape it in. And so it measures the acid in your stomach. And he had reflux like 72 times in 24 hours. It was normal to him, so he couldn't say my stomach hurt. He, and so his pica was a result of he was trying to get rid of pain. Well, it can also be um, behavioral outbursts or behavioral ways of thinking can also get rid of emotional pain. Um, and I'm certainly not a trained counselor, but Folks in your um, different organizations certainly are. So several lists of counselors. So just be aware that one, behavior can be com communication and it can also be a result of trying to get rid of some physical pain or emotional pain, those kinds of things. On the back of your paper, 
or somewhere, do me a favor, write one example of when you think a child's behavior was communicating something. Certainly don't use his or her name, but write one example when you've seen that in your work. Gather your thoughts and then place that example in the chat, if you would. Write one example of when you've seen um, behavior really reflect communication. Become violent or throwing desks, right? Um, absolutely. Cutting their skin on their arm, to, that's very often pain attenuation. Um, sleeping with their head down, uh, when I have students sleeping in class more than a couple days in a row, and then they lash out, very, ah, oh, such insight. Thank you. Hiding in the back or under a desk, um, spelling ass assignment and student had a blank stare, then a tear going, ah, oh, such insight. Oh, you have great insight because the external stuff that's happening reflects some feelings, even if the child can articulate that. Um, refusing to communicate. Good. One of our students would sit in the hall with his head between his knees. Very good. Banging head on the wall uh, because he had a tooth or jaw abscess. Boy, you guys are so insightful to know that externally what we see is not the core issue. So such an insightful group. Child was angry all the time and hitting others. He was nonverbal. Come to find out his his mother's boyfriend was hitting. Oh, I just lost the rest of it. Um, um, but yes, so such good. So it really um, goes through the gamut of children with very significant intellectual disabilities. And I imagine when you, some of the kids who, who may have been nonverbal who were banging their head because of an abscess tooth, all the way to a kid in a spelling test um, starting to cry. So such good insight. Now those three things help us learn a little bit more about kids, but I want to switch to learning about some of this, of how we can switch from learning about students to what we can do. And so my fourth big idea is you can be, and I'm sure you are, this stable, unwavering, and joyful presence for your students. I mean, it's just the impact. I love to speak with people. Sometimes I'm so fortunate and that through my career, I've met many people who have, who have spent years um, supporting kids with the most significant emotional disabilities. Um, and it's just, there's a, when you meet those kind of folks, there's this calming presence. It's kind of this welcoming, joyful, uh, wonderful countenance that they bring to kids. Um, and that they, that's just part of who they there are. And think about how powerful that is. If some kids have been exposed to chaos, this peaceful predictability is just what kids need, right? This wonderful tone. And we all know if kids escalate, that's when we really pull it down. If, if kids' speech gets louder, that's when we get quieter, right? And, but I also want to bring the joyfulness uh, because so people can absolutely be predictable and peaceful and yet still have a spark in their eye, this joyful spark in their eye so that kids know, boy, that teacher is so happy to see me today. And many of you mentioned that um, when I asked about suggestions you would make. And so uh, number four. Right, you can be a stable, unwavering, joyful presence for your students.
which for many kids can be like water to a plant that hasn't had enough water. I mean, it, it's just such, and that doesn't mean kids know how to respond to it, but it can be, and I'm sure you guys have learned that. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit um, about the whole idea that, um, that um, some folks stress some things about saying something positive to every child, smiling to every child. I've seen that. That's a recommendation I give to all teachers all the time is, first of all, um, when you um, before a school year starts, I ask uh, my staff and others that every child should get one phone call. His family should get one phone call and say, we're just so happy we get to spend time with Billy and he's in our class today. Um, we just can't wait. And, and he's just going to bring so much. And I just, all I want to do is call you and tell you, thank you um, for letting us educate him. We're just so, so thrilled he or she is here. So that sets a wonderful um, foundation, but also every at least one time a day when you when children enter your class, and I know some of you spend many hours with some groups and they may not change classes and some kids change classes like you would in a more traditional school. Uh, but I love it when teachers stand at the hall and when kids walk in and they say, boy, I'm glad you're here. I'm happy to see you. I actually saw a high school math teacher do this, um, but she did it in a different way. And I loved it. Uh, it was in a traditional school, and um, I happened to pop into observer class, and I saw the last few minutes of her class, um, and I saw, like, I immediately thought, boy, there's awesome stuff happening in this classroom. But because I caught the last few minutes, the bell rang, and then the kids stepped out, and she stepped to the doorway, and, you know, kids were getting their stuff out of the locker, and then other kids came in. And the, um, the first kid came in, and she said this, wait you know what you have to say before you come in my class? And it was with this wonderful joking. Um, and the child said, I'm not going to say it. As teenagers, sometimes I act like teenagers. And she said, oh, you got to say it to come in my class. And so I was like really stepped close to here. And another child told this one child, you know how you have to say I'm good at math before you go in there? And this other child said, even if we're not good now, if we keep saying it, we'll get good at math. And so the child said, okay, I'm good at math and walked in. And so every kid was expected to say that. And she patted him on the shoulder or she varied it. But it was this wonderful way of kids coming in and the teacher saying, essentially, you're important and I believe in you. Um, and it was about math. And actually, there's a lot of research about if kids think they can be good at math then they can be good at math. So um, it was this wonderful way of kind of touching every child through communication um, when, when they walked in. So it, it certainly can, can vary what that looks like. Number five is this. Provide engaging, rigorous academic instruction because not doing so sends the message that your students are not worth educating. Let me repeat that. Provide engaging, rigorous academic instruction because not doing so sends the message that your students are not worth educating. Um, let me stop sharing this. I wanna turn my video on for a little bit. So in my various positions I've had, um, in the state of Georgia, um, we have a program called GNETS. That's a, um, an acronym. It stands for Georgia's Network for Educational and Therapeutic Services. So it's an acronym because, you know, in, in education, we have to have acronyms. And it's a series of between 23 and 24 programs across the state that serves students with the most significant emotional and behavior disorders. Now, they aren't residential programs, so it's a little different than the state-operated programs um, that you guys are in, even though some may or may not be residential that you do. But this is um, 
23 programs across the state, and they have different sites. Some of the sites, as Ronnie mentioned, are in typical schools, and some of the sites are in standalone um, programs. But in order to, for a child to be placed there, they have to ha have a special education with a, di with a determination, not diagnosis, determination of emotional and behavioral disorders. And they have to be the most extreme. Um, and so the, there's a lot of kids with very, very volatile behavior. But I happened in one of my positions when I worked in a school system was to supervise the director of one of those programs. So in our district, we had a couple of sites. Um, one was in an elementary school and one was in a standalone building. Um, and I just I had such dedicated, incredible folks who worked in those programs. So when I first got that position, I went and visited and, um, and, and took a tour of the building. And I'll be honest with you, um, there was so much effort on the emotional um, and learning of kids, there really wasn't a whole lot of really effective academic instruction. Um, and so what I had to communicate was that if you don't, yes, we must have a process for supporting kids as they grow emotionally and behavioral. But if we're not also providing very effective academic instruction, we are absolutely sending the message that they are so different from their peers without disabilities that they're not worth educate. We can't do that. It com our behavior communicates that to kids, even though that's not our intent. We have to submit in them that, yes, you happen to be working on emotional behavioral um, concerns, but you also are bright and you are, you are more like your peers without disabilities than you are unlike them. And I see a positive future for you. And I believe you can do this work. So providing effective academic instruction along with the emotional stuff is so, so powerful and really, really needed. Do me a favor on a piece of paper, write, um, how kids in your environment respond to engaging academic instruction. Okay, and I know every child, uh, many children have behavioral concerns that happen, but when you provide a very engaging instruction, how do kids respond to that? If you would, put that in the chat. How do kids respond when you provide engaging academic instruction? Put your thoughts in the chat. Um, excited, somebody said, depends on how well it's organized. So good, they seem more eager to learn and stay focused. Excellent. They tend to become immersed. They laugh and get excited. There's excitement for it. They are engaged. Wonderful. By responding back eagerly, they begin to show leaders such good, um, happier and more confident, um, energized and creative. Uh, many of our students um, enjoy it. Um, enjoy the safety and structure of an engaged such differently for different children, absolutely differently, right? It is certainly not a panacea. Confidence, I love that word. Energized and creative, ask questions and engage. Um, such good thoughts. And I love it when people say it depends on how well it's organized. Absolutely. What we absolutely know about kids who struggle is we have to have very organized and systematic instruction. Uh, my students are both surprised they're capable of doing hard work and excited to receive good grades. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, of course, working with kids with orthopedic impairments and then being a special ed administrator, I've had to work with a lot of hospitals traditional hospitals, like where kids go when um, they need some significant health care, 
um, the teaching programs in those hospitals. And one very insightful teacher told me this. And so I'm talking with kids who may have a surgery or kids who uh, may have cancer or something like that. And one of the teachers told me is that distraction is one of the best things to do for pain, for physical pain. And I've never really thought of that. And so she said, that's why we absolutely continue schooling in a hospital setting. And if a kid's there for two days, we're not going to do that. But if a kid's there or more recurrently there, the academic instruction, the schooling is a wonderful distractor to the physical pain. And that makes sense. I would extend it to it also as a distractor to emotional pain. Um, Russell said, depends on how well explained and if they can make connections, I think it will, to what they know. Absolutely. We know effective instruction is highly structured, but it also connects the kids' current knowledge. Such good stuff. And again, the two message of either providing or not providing powerful instruction is by not providing, you're saying the message that you really can't do this, you aren't like other kids, and you're not worth educating, even though I don't think that's the intent. Providing it means you can do this. I believe in you. You're like other students, and your future can be successful. So if you would, for number five on your list, right, providing rigorous and, and enge rigorous, <clears throat> boy, I should have had a comma there, engaging instruction, provide rigorous engaging instruction because not doing so sends the message that your students are not worth educating. And number six is have belief in yourself and your students. And I know I'm speaking to the choir on this. But let's talk about yourselves first. Believing that you can have a huge impact on your students is often referred to as teacher efficacy in the research. And it has a huge impact on the teacher's ability to truly make an impact. And there can be discouraging days. I absolutely know that. There can be discouraging days. But if you truly know that what you do can be powerful for kids and you live in that space, if you believe and live in that space, then you will have a huge impact on it. So let me take this opportunity to kind of tell you how powerful you are that you can have a huge impact. I know some kids spend very little time um, in your program as there's some um, transiency and as what kids, different kids need. But just know by knowing that you have the power to make a difference, it actually impacts what you do and actually impacts what you, the change you have for kids. In fact, um, Dr. John Hattie, um, he is famous for doing some magnificent work called visible learning. Um, and what he has done, he is from Australia, I believe. And several years ago, he wrote a book called Visible Learning. And there's more to that title. But he did tons of meta-analyses. And a meta-analysis is looking at lots of research studies, and even though they use different ways to measure their impact, he could, can pull those together through a meta-analysis. And so what he has done is he looks at various things we've done in school and collected the research and given it an effect size. That's a statistical description, and many of you, I'm sure, are absolutely familiar with visible learning and effect size. 
Um, and this is a statistical thing. Well, anything above about a 0.4 is a good effect size. That means that kids grow at least a year in a year's time. I mean, he's looked at everything, small group instruction, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things, hundreds of things. But a couple of years ago, he added a number one thing to his list. He said this was the most powerful thing. And he referred to it as collective teacher efficacy. When a group of teachers work in a school and they believe in their soul that what they do has power for kids. With that collective belief system, it was a 1.57 effect size. That is massive. That is huge. Effect. So that tells you the effect it had on student performance. Um, and there's a variety of ways to measure student. But that is a huge impact. So the one thing I can, if I can stress to you, is believe that what you can do make, makes a difference. It also impacts what you do, right? I'm going to keep tinkering with what I do to make sure I make a difference. So it's absolutely powerful. I do want to um, talk ab about a belief in your students. And I know I'm speaking to the choir. But many kids have not found those adults who believe in them and see a vision for them. And so that belief in yourself and that belief in your students is just unbelievably powerful. Okay. What I wanna do um, is tell you about an individual student. But before I do, number six, right? Believe in yourself and your students. I want to tell you about a friend of mine, um, and if Katie, if you don't mind pausing the record and let me know that you've had a chance to do that, that'd be great.